here in South Africa. And to help us get a better sense of how we can do this, I'm joined by Adene Nal, who is an Ukrainian convencer at Hamid Paul Attorneys. Adene, good evening and thank you so much for joining us on the show. Good evening and thank you for having me. It's such a pleasure to have you with us, Adene. You know, I want to first just start with um, I mean, when we talk about non-residents buying or even selling property in South Africa, what are some of the key things that they need to look uh, at, I think, at a holistic level? I know you and I are going to go into the nitty-gritties and some of the salient things that we always need to understand and things to watch out for. <coughs> but at a very high level, what are some of the key considerations uh, should they be aware of on the onset of their journey of whether buying or certainly selling a property in South Africa? Look, I think buying a property in South Africa is a um, good investment opportunity for a lot of people. And um, I do believe when you are looking at purchasing property in South Africa, um, first thing is that you actually need to make sure that you do work with a great team. Trickling down from either an agent, uh, a private seller, all the way to attorneys that you actually do trust in taking you from point A to point Z and making the pro uh, property process actually very smooth and helping you to, um, well, to actually to know everything that you need to know and to make sure that you do follow the correct procedures that are required in South Africa to make sure that the property transfer can actually take place. Mm -mm -mm. And I think, you know, one of the, the key things, as you're saying in, in, in your remarks, Arne, is often a lot of uh, non-South Africans certainly do see this as a potential uh, destination to invest in property. I think property prices do sometimes seem quite lucrative for non-South Africans. And I think it can also just be a great addition to your invest overall investment portfolio. Um, and I think that's why I wanted to get into some of the, the nitty gritties and the logistics of it. Because, uh, you know, in as much as buying property is relatively easy, uh, we certainly do want to get a, a sense of some of the logistics that go in when you are a non-resident, uh, non-South African looking to buy property this side. And I think perhaps we'll start with, you know, the, the, the power of attorney, because, I mean, that's one of the things I know when I first, you know, when I first, first bought uh, my properties, I didn't even know about power of attorney certainly not when it comes to property uh, and so when the attorney is sent through the documentation I was like okay what is this uh, you know what is it for so just take it through you know the power of attorney that they would essentially you know sign what's the purpose and of course uh, what they need to look out for in that regard so I think what needs to be established first is whether your client is actually based in South Africa and or whether they're actually based outside of South Africa. Um, obviously, if they're based in South Africa, it's much easier because the client can either sign the documentation themselves or they can appoint somebody else to act on their behalf. We normally do recommend that an attorney is involved when it comes to the drafting of the power of attorney because it is something that is necessary to either go to the deeds office or for the attorney's file itself. And also you want to make sure that the correct um, procedures are followed to make it a valid document. Okay. Um, the second scenario where your client might be overseas, um, what is important to note here is that Either the client might be signing all the documents here yeah, and then they're traveling overseas um, or they might be overseas and not have made their way to South Africa at all. Um, there will be two different scenarios we would to look at here. So the first one would to be if if they had to leave the country but they are still here, um, normally we would require that they sign the power of attorney in South Africa before they actually um, go abroad. This way it's a valid documentation, it does not need authentication. The problem comes in is if the client is already abroad, um, there are certain rules and regulations which needs to be followed when it comes to documents being signed in a foreign country. Okay, so it will be required that the power of attorney actually be um, authenticated in whichever country it is when it is signed. Um, and obviously we will need the original document back. So it will cause a little bit of a delay in the process because they'll have to get it authenticated and then they'll make sh have to make sure that it actually make it, makes its way back to South Africa and to the conveyances. And obviously you need to make sure that the correct procedures are followed to make it a valid document to be used in the transfer process. 
Fiat just joining us this evening. I'm in conversation with Adonai Nal, who's an attorney, and Convenza at Hamad Hall Attorneys. We're looking at how non-residents can buy and sell property. And of course, on our Facebook page, many of you checking in and commenting. Uh, Kaylee Dunley is saying, looking forward to hearing from Adonai Nal. Uh, and I'm, I hope that you are enjoying uh, the show there. And uh, Calais, and I can see that Colin Jansen is checked in and watching Queen Taco also checking in and watching the show. Um, also checking in there on our Facebook page. Do you keep the love coming through? And of course, if you have any questions or comments this evening, do you send them through on our Facebook page as we continue our conversation with Ardenay. Now, Ardenay, I think when we then look at uh, buying a, a property as a non-South African, I think one of the, the key things we certainly say uh, to even South Africans who are buying is that their costs, the additional costs to you know buying property. What are some of the costs to buying uh, as a, a you know as a foreign buyer, uh, especially because as South Africans, often we even ourselves still get shocked at some of the various line items that we have to budget for when buying a property. So I would say some of the costs that the buyers actually need to be aware of if you look at the purchases would be your transfer duty. So transfer duty is a tax that's levied on the purchase price for anything that's over a million rand. Normally this is determined by the sliding scale provided by SARS and um, that would be payable on registration. Well before registration to get our transfer duty receipt. Um, so I would definitely say that there's something that the buyer should be aware of is your transfer duty. And then something else would also be VAT. It might be that you've got a buyer who's actually purchasing from a developer um, per se and VAT would be applicable. Normally your offer to purchase would state that VAT is included in the purchase price but normally that is included in the purchase price buying from a development. Um, yeah, so, so that would be one of the things, uh, or two of the things that I would say that your buyers need to be aware of. Um, it's also just important to remember that um, it's either transfer duty or VAT that's applicable to a transaction. It can't be both. Mm -hmm. um, so I think a lot of people do get confused whether VAT and transfer duty is payable, but it can't. It, it, it just cannot be both. Um, it needs to be either or. Um, and then also some of the costs I would rather say our sellers need to be aware of is your capital gains tax. So we aren't um, tax professionals, um, but basically your capital gains tax would be a tax that's levied on your gain that is made from the, or from the sale of your property. So we would normally advise the clients to consult with an auditor or an accountant because they'll be actually in a position to calculate the capital gains for you. They'll be able to advise you what you are looking at. Um, obviously, we can't advise on that because we don't specialize in that. So I would always advise, speak to your um, auditors, speak to your accountant because they'll be able to advise you. And also there's certain exclusions that you look at. For example, when it comes to capital gains tax, you have an exclusion exclusion of 2 million rand. Um, however, this exclusion only applies to your natural people. It doesn't apply to companies, trusts, your closed corporations. Um, and then there's obviously other exclusions that we can look at for improvements at the property. But once again, your your accountant will be able to direct you into the right direction and they'll be able to give you more or less the figure that you're looking at at which you will be liable for. And unfortunately, if, if it's not your primary residence, this 2 million rand does not, does not actually apply to you at all. So it, it is something that people do tend to forget when they do purchase properties, especially for investment purposes, because if it's not your primary residence, um, it's very difficult getting out of that one because SARS will definitely, definitely pick up on that. Um, and then something, you know, that should be considered as well is your withholding tax. Um, again, not a property or not a tax practitioner. So best would be is to, to chat to your auditor or your accountant. Um, but basically withholding tax is for any property which is sold for over 2 million. It is actually required that a portion of the, of the funds be withheld and paid over to SARS. They normally say that the buyer needs to pay it over to SARS, but the attorneys do normally get involved and do or will normally assist the client when it does come to, to those specific payments that needs to be made. Mm. Yeah. I, and, and I think, you know, um, 
I don't know, one of the things then that we, we have to explore is if you're going to be buying property, you're going to need financing. Uh, I mean, as South Africans, we know that there are different ways that we go about financing uh, our property purchases, whether you're borrowing from friends and family, you're of course getting a home loan or other uh, interesting ways of raising the capital. When we look at the, the various ways that uh, non-South Africans can finance their purchase, you know, is a bond an option? And are there any things that they need to bear in mind in the event where they want to get uh, a home loan facility with any of the local banks? So obviously, first price would be to purchase it cash because then there's no worries of applying for a bond. Um, but does, when it does come to a bond, yes, they can actually apply for a bond. However, it's highly unlikely that the banks would actually grant the buyer, the foreign purchaser, a um, 100% home loan. So out of experience, it's normally between a 30 to 50, if lucky, percent um, grant, which they do obtain. So what they need to bear in mind is that a 100% home loan is highly not uh, well, it's probably not going to happen and they do need to have cash to actually make up the balance to secure the purchase price. Mm. And I am this evening in conversation with Adonai Nell, who's an attorney and conveyancer at Hamid Paul Attorneys. We're looking at how non-residents can buy and sell property. I can see all the love that we're getting on our Facebook page. Do keep sending that love. Certainly do continue uh, tagging your friends and family and of course sharing this live. Uh, I see Tashi Combs tuning in and watching and also tagging her friends and family. Katle Hom Tembu saying great advice. Thank you. We'll absolutely love that you're enjoying it and finding the advice useful. Katle um, Hom. And uh, so glad Shurinda um, saying sellers costs when selling, one bond cancellation costs, and the second is your COC. And, and I want us to perhaps, you know, look at that. I mean, when we sell, obviously, I don't know, you, as, as a seller, there are a few costs that are associated with selling, not as much as when you're buying, um, but when you haven't sold a property, you may not know of them. So let's assume for purposes of this, it's a, it's a bank financed property. Uh, they were able to get some financing from one of the major banks. Uh, so from the seller side, what are some of those other, just because it's literally small costs. I mean, earlier you mentioned, for instance, they need to of course be mindful of capital gains tax and uh, withholding tax. But I think in the normal sale of business, what are those other associated costs? So speaking in a normal transaction, um, so you would if there's a bond registered over the property, um, you would definitely have to look at the uh, cost for actually cancelling the bond, um, and then your COC. Um, if there's a gas compliance certificate, which needs to be com or be provided as well, but your COC, the gas compliance certificate, there might even be, for instance, where a beetle certificate is required, or um, for a damp certificate is required, but all of these stuff would be actually stipulated in your offer to purchase with regards to the specific certificates which are required for registration to take place. So even though these certificates might not be a deeds office requirement, it still is a requirement that needs to be complied with before registration can take place. So. Um, Normally, you know, obviously it will depend on where the property is, if it's at coast, if it's in the coastal area, if it's inland, because that would also depend on where the beetle certificate is applicable. Um, obviously, a COC needs to be supplied and um, a gas certificate needs to be supplied if you do have gas on the premises. Um, and then you would also look at your rates. So how it normally works is uh, rates figures are requested three to four months in advance so the client will be requested to pay that specific amount um, in order to obtain a rate certificate okay normally the clients do get a fright because it, it can either be a very big amount or or not so big um, but in order for council to actually issue us with a rates clearance certificate which is required for the deeds office the client will be re required to pay that um, that amount of money in order for us to obtain our certificate it is also important to remember that normally the sellers do get a refund because normally transfer um, does happen before the three to four months has expired and um, council does refund the client on a pro rata basis um, 
of the registration has taken place. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, one of the, the key things is when you are aware of the admin that lies ahead of you, whether you're a buyer or a seller, it certainly does make the process so much better. I think more often than not, the first time I sold, uh, I, I wasn't aware of some of the, you know, the steps. I and, and, and the, I suppose the upside is that selling is actually easier uh, and there's slightly less admin certainly when you are the seller um, than when you're on the other side purchasing that property. Now, I don't know, one of the things, of course, is if you're a non-South African, and South Africans, we go through this as well, is you may be looking at different vehicles to use to purchase a property. So can foreign companies or foreign trusts um, be able to, to purchase property in South Africa? And how would that process uh, you know, differ, if at all? Um, yes. Uh, your foreign companies and trusts can actually purchase a property in South Africa. However, there are certain requirements that have to be met. So, first of all, when it comes to a trust, um, it is required that it be registered with the Master of the High Court of South Africa in order for the trust to actually purchase property. So, I would recommend to, you know, get in contact with people on this side who will be able to assist you in that process and getting the trust registered with the master of the high court. Um, and then obviously when it comes to a foreign company wanting to purchase property, it's normally required that this foreign company um, registers the entity um, with the regulatory authority. And normally um, it's also required that a representative be appointed in South Africa who represents the company um, with the transaction going forward. For, certainly for closing remark, any other uh, final tip for our viewers at home who either they themselves are non-South Africans or of course have friends and family who are non-South Africans who are looking to buy or sell a property this year? So <clears throat> what I would recommend is if, obviously if you've got any questions, you're more than welcome to direct it to, to our firm. We're more than happy to, to assist you guys in, in any of your property related questions or if you need any assistance um, but you know I think I can't say it enough is to get a good team on your side um, a very good conveyancing team who actually does assist you with all your needs um, you know who does bend over backwards or does assist you which whatever it might be even if you know the attorney firm cannot assist you with certain tax related queries that they do partner with somebody who can for example assist you with that so basically having a team um, an overall team that can look after your needs and I think that's such an important note to leave it at. Want to make sure that you surround yourself with the right team. And we emphasize this all the time right here on the show, regardless of whether you're you know, a first time buyer or of course a property investor, having that power team is so crucial. Well, Adene, that's where we're going to leave it this evening. Thank you so much for joining us on the show. Thank you very much for having me. And that is Adene Nal, who is an attorney and conveyancer at Hamid Paul Attorneys, wrapping up the Monday edition of the Private Property Podcast with myself, Uzamandungwa Kumalo. Well, it's been an interesting and certainly an amazing evening to be with you this evening. Before we sign out, I actually want to give a, a shout out. It's the first time I'm seeing this name in the comment section uh, to Pelisha Makjola. Thank you for tuning in and also commenting down there. Of course, keep the comments coming. I absolutely love hearing from you at home. Well, we, that's where we're going to leave it this evening. I'll be back on your screens tomorrow evening at 7 p.m. Until then, hope you're staying home and staying safe.